All right. Uh, let's uh, let's let in let's let the audience in. All right, I'm doing it. Uh, good evening, everyone. We've got a few people who are still filtering in, so if you can just be patient as we let a few more in to begin the presentation. All right, why don't we get started? Um, thank you all for joining us this evening. Uh, my name is Gib Vaconi. My pronouns are he and him. I'm the chair of the Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council, and I'd like to welcome you all to our 2023 Prospect Heights Open Streets Town Hall meeting. Um, this is a meeting that we like to um, present in advance of the start of our Open Street season and um, make sure that uh, uh, folks have a chance to find out about what's planned for the year and um, and ask some questions. So thank you all for making the time to join tonight. And before we go too much farther, uh, I want to acknowledge that um, we we regret having um, uh, having made the oversight of scheduling this meeting um, on Passover. Um, it was uh, actually quite challenging finding a date for the meeting uh, because of. Uh, the both community board schedules that conflict with the, these first few weeks of April, as well as uh, some of our internal meetings and some of the travel schedules of folks who are important to have on this at this meeting tonight. So um, in our desire to try to uh, fit all of those boxes, um, we did not understand what was uh, that we were scheduling it over a religious holiday. So again, we apologize. The meeting is being recorded. And if you are watching this um, on the recording, you are welcome to reach us with any questions that you have that are not answered in, in, during the course of the meeting tonight um, by sending an email to openstreets, one word, at phndc.org. And um, you're always welcome to reach us in that way if you have any questions or concerns. Um, I see that there's a hand raised, but we're going to wait on questions till later in the uh, in the presentation that that will that will come at the end of the presentation. Um, so uh, let's uh, let's spend a minute and talk a bit about the mission of our open streets program. Um, the mission of our open streets program aligns with actually the mission of the Prospect Heights Neighborhood Development Council, which is to bring community members together to create uh, a safer, more just and sustainable neighborhood. So in our open streets program, we're looking to create and support public space for everyone to come together and enjoy. Uh, we are looking to support local businesses and artists. We advocate for safer, healthier, and more environmentally sustainable streets and neighborhood. And we use this program as an opportunity to reimagine the streets, streetscape. Um, and, and this is an, an idea, an area especially where um, safety, uh, sustainability, and equity um, kind of come into play for us. Um, so these are these are the goals we're trying to uh, support through operating these programs. And we are very excited to be moving into our fourth year of Open Streets and Prospect Heights. Um, this is a program that's brought together a tremendous number of people 
from the community um, that volunteer their time to help put it together. And you're going to hear from a number of them here this evening tonight. So uh, without further ado, I would like to turn the program over to uh, our um, Open Streets Committee Chair, Saskia Hargens. Thanks, Gib. Hi, everyone. I'm Saskia. My pronouns are they, them. And I am one of the organizers of the program this year. And as Gib mentioned, this is our fourth year of running the Open Streets. And before I get into our, our plans and dreams for this year, I wanted to reflect a bit on, on what we've done the past year. We do try to improve the program every year, whether by expanding our programming, our outreach, our uh, organizational operation, um, and the people involved every year, we try to uh, make the program better. So I'd like to uh, uh, talk a bit about the highlights or we think are the highlights of the past season before jumping into our, our plans for next year. So here are some numbers on, on um, the Vanderbilt Open Street last year. We have had thousands of visitors every week. We, we ran the program for 34 weekends, April through November. Um, we did counts on the use of the bike lane and on, on average, we see about 500 cyclists per hour. That's a really substantial number of people using a safe bike corridor that we create. And we did had 89 different uh, uh, performers or bands, uh, family, kids activities, 89 different events um, on the Vanderbilt Open Street. We had 132 individual donors that includes corporate sponsors as well as individual donors, um, such as perhaps yourself. And this uh, is very important to, to fund our program. We have more than 60 volunteers involved. And I, I do want to highlight that Vanderbilt and as well as Underhill I'll get to next are um, run by PHNDC, which is an entirely volunteer run organization. Um, so all of the programming that you um, hopefully have enjoyed so far is all brought to you by volunteer efforts. So really grateful for everyone who's helped out so far, whether by moving barriers, by helping behind the scenes, posting signs and flyers, etc. Uh, all of that is only made possible by uh, neighbors coming together uh, creating these open streets. And then we have on Vanderbilt, our, our, our business partners, uh, 24 restaurants pr uh, participated in the program last year. Uh, that includes financial and logistical support. And of course, um, many of them set up in the street um, for outdoor dining. Here are some examples of the uh, programming we did. We had several bigger events last year. Um, we had the Bindelse Family Circus come back. Thanks for uh, thanks to DOT for sponsoring that. It was a very popular event. We had a series of salsa socials. We did four socials um, on on the street in the summer. Also, a very well attended event. And we did for the first time a big. Pride celebration during Brooklyn Pride. This was together with Branded Saloon. We had two days of Pride um, on, on Vanderbilt Avenue. So these are some of the bigger events. We also had every weekend family programming, activities for kids, uh, various bands and other musicians performing. And then in addition to Vanderbilt, we also have the Underhill Open Street. There we do some more low-key programming. Um, we had recurring events that were that developed a, a, a loyal following. We had yoga with uh, Shambhala Yoga Studio every Tuesday evening on the Underhill Open Street. We'll be bringing that back this season. Um, we had skateboarding workshops with Skate Everything. We did a whole series of those on Underhill and then later in the season brought those to Vanderbilt as well. Um, at the end of the season last year, we had Halloween on Underhill. I think that's the busiest I've ever seen the Underhill Open Street was extremely well attended. Um, and at, in November, we created the Underhill Plaza for which we had the opening um, ceremony in, in January of this year. And that was 
for us a really uh, special moment because it was the first um, really tangible permanent outcome of the Open Streets program. And I think what's what I would like to highlight here is that perhaps an a, an outcome of the program that we hadn't necessarily anticipated when it first started during the peak of the pandemic is that it really gave people um, it, it sort of it sparked a lot of people's imagination of how we can use our public space and it really gave people new ways of looking at our streetscape and how um, we can reimagine using uh, our streets of course on 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 the weekends on Vanderbilt when we when we have our open street uh, during the week on Underhill um, but it also really created a lot of appetite for for more permanent changes to our streetscape and the Underhill Plaza is the first direct outcome of that later we'll hear from Kyle Gorman from DOT about uh, uh, more street improvement changes coming to our streets so I won't uh, preempt that but the Underhill Plaza is a really exciting first development in that uh, longer term project. So we'll we'll be doing uh, 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 we'll be using that plaza uh, this season for programming as well. I already mentioned DOT, who's of course our our main partner in all of this. Um, yesterday, no, on Monday, you may have noticed. Uh, we got a big delivery of, of, of equipment from DOT, all the barriers and science furniture um, arrived. So that's all getting ready for, for the start of the season. Also want to highlight the operational support we're getting uh, from DOT. Uh, um, this is provided by uh, the Horticultural Society of New York. They're, the ones who set up the barriers every day on Underhill. They set up the furniture on Underhill Plaza and also provide some maintenance. They take care of the planters and uh, as well as the tree beds on, on Underhill and Vanderbilt. So that has been super helpful. So you might recall uh, originally we had a whole volunteer operation for running the Underhill Open Street, uh, setting up the barriers every day. So it's been super helpful to have the Horde take care of that. Um, additionally, through Council Member Hudson's office, we also have been in the season receiving support from ACE on front of sanitation on Vanderbilt, which has also been super helpful um, with all those additional visitors to the open street. Uh, we want to make sure um, the, the street remains clean and the trash cans uh, lined, et cetera. So that's been extremely helpful. And we're happy to have that support again this upcoming season. All right, so as you may have noticed, we just earlier this week switched Underhill back to summer hours. That means Underhill now on Mondays through Thursdays is from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. again. On Friday, we end at 4 p.m. because that's when uh, the switch to, to Vanderbilt uh, will take place. Underhill Plaza is 24-7. Uh, the, the furniture is up during uh, uh, during the day. The start of Vanderbilt season will be April 21st. The hours will be similar to, to past years. So Fridays from 5 to 10 p.m. and on Saturdays and Sundays from noon to 10 p.m. The season this year will run uh, from the 21st of April Earth Day weekend through the end of October. We'll start off by a big Earth Day event that Catherine will talk about in a second. And we're planning again to hold uh, a Halloween event on Underhill. Halloween is on a weekday again this year, so we'll be, uh, we'll be an Underhill uh, program. All right, that's everything I wanted to share for now, and I'll pass it on to Catherine to talk a bit more about the programming plans for the opening weekend and beyond. Hi, all It's Catherine. Um, my pronouns are she, her, and Saskia already covered a lot of the highlights of what we did last year, and we will be 
um, hopefully revisiting a lot of those. Um, things like the larger salsa events, yoga, and street lab, color architect kids, a lot of the things that engage a big broad group of our, our, our community. Um, then we're starting with Earth Day, which is gonna be a really great day. Um, on Underhill Plaza, we're gonna be starting first thing in the morning with a community cleanup. And we're gonna be having music from the egalitarian brass band. And then we have a really fantastic called uh, Blue Breast Bus Project. And then the Czech marionettes, which um, features marionettes that are, I believe, over 100 years old. Um, so it's all about focusing on uh, sustainable art, sustainable culture, sustainable ways to, um, to create entertainment um, and programming that is, you know, kind of fits into the car-free Earth Day um, theme that we're working with, which is generally a theme we try to, to commit to throughout the year, but this way we can really lean into it. So that's Underhill. And then on Vanderbilt Avenue, we're gonna have African drummers and dancing. Uh, we're gonna have a, an artist named Gerson Lanza who will tap um, and have some music as well. Um, Hula Nation will be back to teach you how to hula hoop all ages. We'll have chalk drawing as well for kids. And again, anyone else who wants to join in. A um, fantastic group called Milkman and Sons, who does traditional blues and also kind of prohibition era jazz instruments you're familiar with and instruments that they've made out of things. So again, kind of finding new ways to use what's old. And then uh, we're going to have a presence with, from the Class and Community Fridge. We are here last year as well, if you're not familiar with what they do. Um, it's a fantastic community fridge that began during the pandemic and is just always um, full, well, ideally always full of food and and um, other supplies for the community. And it's a wonderful team of volunteers who keep it going. And so we're kind of spreading the word, word of there. And um, right now we're in the early uh, stages of programming for the season. We're kind of thinking out into the future, things that we did last year, we will do again. Um, hopefully, like we said, Halloween on Underhill Avenue, which was super fun, super well attended, but also just a really great way to provide some car free space for kids trick or treating, which is always a bit, can be a bit of a challenge, especially with all of the um, uh, construction that we've got going on these days. Um, we'll also have a big Halloween weekend on Vanderbilt Avenue. Uh, we did a costume parade for the past two years. We did a pizza party. We had brass bands dressed like pizza, all, all kinds of fun stuff that we're hoping to revisit. Um, and to that end, if there are things that you really loved last year or the year before or the year before, we'd like to see again, things that you haven't seen that you think would be a great addition, please um, reach out to me directly or that e the email address that I, I dropped above that Gib mentioned, open streets at PHNDC. Um, the more the more input that we get, the more the more fun it is, the more diverse it is, um, and that is the goal. Uh, and I think that's all I got for the moment. All right, thank you, Catherine and Saskia. Um, up next, we uh, are going to hear from one of uh, our merchants on Vanderbilt Avenue, who's been a part of the Open Streets program over the couple over the last couple of years. Um, let me uh, introduce Michael Weatherby, uh, who's the proprietor at Alta Caledad. Uh, thank you, Gib. I apologize if my reception is bad. I got stuck in traffic, so I'm dialing in. But uh, can you guys hear me okay? We can. Okay. Well, I appreciate the opportunity to speak. Um, you know, we, Alta Khalidad, <clears throat> I'm one of the co-owners and my business partner, Chef Akhtar Nawab. Uh, in March, we celebrated our sixth anniversary of uh, being on Vanderbilt Avenue, half of which, unfortunately, has been, fortunately and unfortunately, has been uh, in a COVID environment, right? And so uh, what I would like to say about Street, which I'm a, a huge mission to contribute in any way, is that um, it's without question for us that the um, existence of Alta Calida would not be here right now uh, without the open streets. You know, I think, um, you know, the other day I was looking back on just by chance on some old pictures of the day before restaurants shut down 
because of COVID uh, in mid-March in 2020. And it really um, was the Open Streets program, an initiative put together by the community and, and members uh, that are on this phone call right now that not only allowed us to survive, but allowed us to flourish, right? You know, it's from that that we were able to grow our company. Um, you know, because effectively we went from a 30 seat restaurant to, you know, two to two and a half times, right? So, you know, the the end result of that, or, you know, a main result of that was not only allowing us to bring everybody back after uh, a few weeks uh, and really continuing to kind of operate through the summer, uh, but we brought on more people, you know, because our, the size of our, our location doubled. And so uh, where a lot of our colleagues, I apologize about the sound, but where a lot of our colleagues throughout New York, uh, chefs and other restaurateurs, you know, half of which that we knew closed restaurants. I, I know that certainly Alta Calidad and a number of restaurants on Vanderbilt Avenue in particular were able to stay open uh, in, in an environment over you know, the last couple of years or several years that uh, the, m a good amount of our colleagues were not able to. So um, we want to say thank you to um, you know, everybody that's involved in the open streets, to the community that um, supports it. Um, but I think, you know, and I speak on behalf of our team members that <clears throat> I think with a lot of people, and <laughs> I could go down the rabbit hole, but I think with a lot of people and guests forget with respect to restaurants, is there's a whole team of people behind the scenes that uh, make it function, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, a, a lot of people who, if they were to lose their job, um, maybe don't have the same resources and don't have the same um, ability to find a job quickly. And so when, you know, those of us in the restaurant industry close a restaurant, uh, it has a ripple effect in the community and certainly the community that's connected to our restaurant. So again, you know, uh, I can't say enough about Open Streets and, and what it means to us as business owners, but also to the team members that we employ and to their families. So um, anything that we can do to contribute and um, anything, anybody who's on here, if you have the ability to contribute, just uh, know it's more than just, you know, supporting your favorite restaurant, but everybody that's uh, connected to it. Gabby, you're muted. No, that's it for me. Thank you, Michael. Um, I, I want to take this opportunity to mention, as Michael said, we did begin Open Streets on Vanderbilt Avenue with a with an economic relief goal in mind. I mean, that was a very, very difficult period of time for restaurants, of which we have many on Vanderbilt Avenue. And we were concerned that, that some businesses might not survive the pandemic. Um, now, uh, I, I, I want to say that in... Our, the subsequent years, the restaurants have really have have, have really joined in, in in helping to enable this program, not just with um, help from some of their employees who who in past years have helped us do set up and breakdown, but also financially. Um, our our restaurant partners um, help underwrite the cost of um, running the street, and um, it's 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 really. In, in in our view, tremendous that we were able to go from a place of um, coming together to help businesses in need during the pandemic to a place where those same businesses are thriving today and, and helping to um, keep this program going that 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 helps to um, you know bring a new level of community to the main street of Prospect Heights. There's there are there are a couple of other folks I see on the Zoom meeting who are proprietors of businesses. On Vanderbilt Avenue, I see um, Patrick and Gerard from Branded, as well as Liz from White Tiger. Um, if any of you care to say a couple words, um, would would also love to have your uh, your thoughts as well. If not, you don't have to feel put upon, but I just wanted to make that opportunity. Thank you to everybody in the community that has come out to this uh, town hall. Uh, Branded is a really important fixture in the community, just like White Tiger, just like the new NUA table that kind of came during the pandemic. Um, uh, so many of the restaurants leave an indelible mark on the children of the community, uh, the ability to celebrate uh, milestones throughout the community. And I think um, at times when 
you know, the traffic is a little bit uh, m more uh, high on a Friday night when we're closing down the streets. Sometimes it can get a little bit uh, lost in the weeds of all of the joy that you see being out on the streets on all of the weekends and seeing the kids have a, an expanded space to create and to uh, just play. And um, I am forever in the debt of the community and this organization for helping save our bar. So thank you deeply. Thank you, Patrick. All right. Um, hi, this is Liz from White Tiger. Just real quick, I also wanted to say I'm so grateful and so thankful that we have open streets. It is not just a boom to our business, um, but it is also, it has drawn the community together. And I think that the pluses that we got, the benefits that we got from being really feeling like we're part of the community of P Prospect Heights and um, being able to connect with other businesses that are part of this as well, but also with the community that lives there um, to hear what they're saying. It has um, truly been a wonderful opportunity, I think, for us as a business to really feel like we're part of the home space of Prospect Heights. And um, Open Streets is a huge, huge hand that helped us to do that. And so I'm very, very thankful for that. Thank you. Thanks, Liz and Patrick, for uh, for sharing your thoughts. I, I think at this point, our uh, our next presenter um, is Kyle Gorman from the Department of Transportation. So, Kyle, um, always a pleasure to have you with us. And why don't you take it away? Thank you so much, Gib, and all of our uh, great, amazing partners at PHNDC. Thank you so much for hosting this tonight, and everyone else who's joining us. Thank you. Uh, to uh, all of you for joining us tonight to also learn more about what's planned for um, one of our best and biggest open streets in the city, um, as well as what I'm now going to talk about, which is central to the permanent open streets program. Um, before I get into some of the design proposals that we're going to highlight tonight for Vanderbilt and Underhill, I also wanted to mention that um, open streets is now a permanent program in New York City, thanks to legislation that was passed in 2021 and that eventually signed into law by the mayor. And we just recently released a set of formal rules and guidelines for the program. So we are well on our way to uh, making open streets uh, permanent forever here in New York City, which is really exciting. Um, and one huge part of uh, becoming a permanent program is actually permanently transforming streets uh, to make them prioritize bikes, pedestrians, and public transit riders, um, because that is really the trajectory that our city is going on. Uh, we want to build out as much infrastructure for people who walk, for bike, who take the train or bus, use public transit, while uh, mitigating uh, vehicle use, but still allowing for limited local access. Um, so lots of exciting new design proposals have been proposed for open streets all across the city, as well as here uh, right in Prospect Heights. Um, so with that, um, we're primarily focusing on um, the open street section of Vanderbilt between Atlantic and Park Place, as well as Underhill between um, Atlantic and Eastern Parkway. The plaza, the pedestrian plaza that was implemented back in um, November of last year, which we all painted, which was super exciting, um, including myself, um, we, uh, that is a part of the, the eventual plan uh, for the entire quarter, which I'm going to highlight uh, in just a second. But first, let's talk about Vanderbilt. So let's go to the next slide. So on Vanderbilt, what we really want to start to do is make this a corridor that is safe 24-7. Um, there's a lot of added benefits uh, from the open street that takes place on the weekends, but we want to make sure that we're not only designing our streets uh, to make them uh, amazing places on the weekends for open streets, but also places where it is safe to walk and bike um, and just enjoy all that this neighborhood has to offer. So um, you might have noticed um, recently, uh, last fall, we were able to Im implement a number of curb extensions uh, at uh, various corners throughout the corridor. The curb extensions that I'm referring to uh, are right at the corners where you're seeing this tan paint color. Uh, those are not yet filled with that tan paint, which is actually called epoxy gravel. Uh, because we weren't able to get it in before the weather got too um, cold last year, 
uh, but the, the thermoplastic double white line markings have been put down and you'll notice that there's already some added benefits from having these curb extensions uh, to make it safer to cross the street. We're also able to add more bike parking and more pedestrian circulation space. Uh, the other major change, um, two other changes that I wanna highlight is um, sort of normalizing the geometry um, at the turn bay medians. Um, the ways that they were designed uh, before were not up to DOT standards. Um, so the flush medians um, where they're painted, not the concrete median blocks uh, are being normalized to the new DOT geometry. And then um, an added benefit of all of this project is also more loading space. Um, I, I don't need to tell anyone here, um, more so than ever before, we're getting more of our deliveries by uh, Amazon, Fresh Direct, FedEx, all the different types of courier and delivery services that we rely on for our day-to-day -day lives. So DOT wanted to add a little bit more space uh, for loading, generally speaking, but as well as when the open street is in effect on the weekends because of prevalent condition that some of you might be aware of is sometimes delivery vehicles were parking um, in the intersection, so they actually don't have a dedicated space uh, to, to load, unload, uh, and so on. Um, so we can move on to the next slide. Um, this is the southern section of Vanderbilt, which is a little bit south of where the actual open street is, but wanted to throw some love at this section of the open street as well, too. So you'll see uh, various uh, opportunities for new curb extensions, upgrading the bike facilities to conventional bike lanes, um, and new pedestrian islands at uh, Plaza Street, where Plaza Street and Vanderbilt meet right at the, the top of Grand Army Plaza, uh, as well as loading zones like I talked about before. Next slide. Um, we also were able to add a few uh, curb extensions along Plaza Street East and West. Um, these were implemented uh, for the most part last fall, except for the epoxy gravel. Um, so we'll come back uh, this year to implement the gravel, the, the tan color that you see on the screen, but the double white lines are already in. Next slide. Um, so now moving on to Underhill, we're going to go from south to north, so starting at Eastern Parkway. Um, the uh, particular section between Eastern Parkway and St. John's Place is not a part of the open street, but as a part of this design proposal, uh, DOT is, is adding a, a lot of new features to make that uh, section safer for all road users as well. So adding a new crossing at Lincoln Place um, for folks to cross um, east to west um, across Underhill, new curb extensions and normalizing the geometry as well at St. John's Place. Um, I actually live in the neighborhood and I'm very familiar with this particular intersection. And in my um, observation, it's you know way over engineered for the amount of traffic that is using this particular intersection. It's incredibly wide, um, but generally speaking, there's very, very low traffic volumes. If anything, there's more pedestrians and cyclists going through this intersection on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, so really exciting opportunity to add some curb extensions and traffic calming elements to uh, better reflect the actual day-to-day -day users of that particular space. Now on the block between St. John's, sorry, just go back for one second. Um, now on the block between St. John's and Sterling, um, we're prototyping a relatively new traffic calming element in New York City. It's actually something that's been implemented in a number of other cities across the nation, but it is a new median island type of traffic calming element that will encourage uh, slow speed by a gentle curve for, um, for uh, vehicles, uh, but allowing for uh, bike uh, priority. So we're gonna be making this a bike boulevard as well. So uh, this corridor now is also gonna be designed for five mile per hour. So this um, new median traffic calming element is sort of encouraging those slow speeds, reminding people of the five mile per hour uh, speed limit with signage, um, as well as other facilities that make it better to walk and bike. Uh, moving on to the next slide, please. Um, so this is between Sterling and St. Mark's. Um, you can see very similar types of treatments on the next block between Sterling and uh, Park Place with the median traffic calming uh, designing for slow speeds. Um, on the block between Park Place and Prospect, um, whereas it is currently two-way uh, for vehicles, so vehicles can drive north and south, it is actually going to be uh, converted to a one-way southbound uh, direction only for uh, vehicles. Uh, cyclists and, of course, pedestrians can still uh, travel in a north-south direction, but moving forward on this block, 
um, it will only be one way for southbound vehicles. Um, on the next block is one of our, our lighter touch blocks that'll have green um, greeneries at the gateways uh, to add some traffic calming element, as well as other uh, bike lane features such as Sharrows, Greenback Sharrows um, to uh, reinforce the uh, bike boulevard concept. Uh, moving on to the next slide. Between um, St. Mark's and uh, Bergen Street, where the PS9 is, um, that block is also going to become one way southbound for vehicles. So uh, just limiting the amount of vehicles that are going on this block, making it a lot safer for uh, pickup, drop off, and just the general um, amount of uh, young people who are in this area, making this as safe as possible on this block. Uh, will continue to be two-way uh, for cyclists as well as for pedestrians. Um, and then on the block between Bergen and Dean, you'll see again our, our new um, traffic coming uh, median element um, on, on actually both blocks uh, between Bergen and Dean and Pacific and Dean. Um, and uh, finally, um, the pedestrian plaza between Atlantic and Pacific is already implemented. I know it's, um, it's shown in tan, but it's actually a nice teal color. Um, so really exciting that we were able to implement that as a part of the, the first phase of this um, project in 2022. Um, and in terms of project implementation for both Underhill and Vanderbilt, we're looking like a late summer. Um, it should be quick. This is not concrete or anything uh, major construction wise. It's generally just paint, planters, granite blocks, things like that. Um, so uh, we'll keep you updated on any project implementation items. And the last thing that I wanted to also mention is that in May, DOT is going to be hosting an in-person event on the Underhill Open Street, uh, where we'll be able to take a little bit of a deeper dive into all of these design proposals. You can ask questions, and we'll have a little bit more to share about uh, when this will all go in the ground. Um, that wraps it up for me. Um, I'm happy to take any questions um, later on, but I'll take it back over to Gib to wrap us up. All right. Thank you very much, Kyle. Um, and um, uh, I'd like to say just a couple of things. Um, if uh, for those of you who are interested in what you've just um, what you've just heard about, um, there's a couple. There's several different ways you can get involved if you're interested in being uh, a part of the Open Streets effort in Prospect Heights. Um, so I'm going to first of all post a couple links here. Um, if you have questions about anything you've heard tonight or anything that comes up in the future, you can always contact us at openstreets at phndc.org. If you're interested in volunteering and helping to do some of the um, some of the organizing and, and execution of the Open Streets programs here, it's a great way to have some fun on a sunny day uh, in Prospect Heights. So you can visit the URL that I've um, that I've posted into the um, the chat there for volunteering. Um, there are other ways you can participate as well. Uh, we do um, we mentioned that we're delighted to be able to get some of our funding from restaurant partners. Some funding we also received from the city of New York, but but an important part of our fundraising is also um, contributions from the public. And um, if you are interested in helping to make this program a success with your financial report or your support, I'm gonna now paste in a link to our GoFundMe that's now active. And we hope that you'll take a few minutes and, and make a tax deductible donation there. And then lastly, if you are a business owner uh, or uh, an entrepreneur or a proprietor um, uh, of uh, some other type of a business here in Prospect Heights, um, we have some uh, sponsorship opportunities that we make available. It also represents an important part of our support. And if you are if you are interested in something like that, um, you can email us at development at ph ndc.org and you can hit that uh, um, you can hit that URL or that that email address from here as well. Um, so now we will um, we will open it up to questions. I'd like to ask that if you do have a question, please raise your hand using Zoom and I'll call on you um, in order. Uh, I'm going to call on uh, first Joseph um, Alexio. I, I hope I pronounced your name correctly. Why don't you go ahead and unmute? That was almost there. It's Alexiu, but you were great. Listen, I'm also last name challenged, so you know I I I I, I get it. So I'm I I'm glad I got close. Ficconi, right? 
Uh, that's right. That's a that, that's a good Italian pronunciation of an American. Bene, Italian Italian. Non è bene. Okay, so yes. um, to thank you for your presentation. Before I say anything else, I want to say that there's a lot about open streets that I like. And so thank you for all of that. You do great stuff, but um, I, uh, you are not forgiven for doing this on the first night of Passover, none of you. I'm sorry to say this, but like I have to take time away from my family for this meeting. I've been living in this neighborhood for 12 years almost. And I have never been able to get to these meetings because I'm always going to Gowanus meetings. And that's where I work, but I live here. And so the fact that I haven't made it is a communication problem. I'm a journalist and I've been living here for a long, long time. And again, I like a lot of what is going on here, but like Jewish people only do confession once a year and it takes place in the fall. So you get the rest of the year to think about how none of you in New York City were able to get it together to realize that tonight's the first night of Passover. It's like doing it on Easter Sunday night. I'm sorry, but no, no, no. So that's the tone that I have to set with my questions, as you know. My second question regards Underhill. My block association, not that we're like a democratic body exactly, we don't really see Underhill the same way. I live at St. John's in Underhill and I have been board president twice in my building. And our biggest concern on the block is the rat problem, which is so bad that DOT is covering it up. So I went to Columbia. I've been living in New York City for most of my life. I grew up on Long Island. I have commercial real estate in the city. And that was a beautiful presentation with really tall buildings in the background sponsoring this. And I wanna say that Underhill, since you guys have been blocking it off since COVID and I get why you did it, we needed to, like room to breathe and move. And I support that. I actually know the Czech Marinette Theater. I worked for them doing data entry. Hey, Bonnie, like, hey, I see you guys. I understand what you want to do and also what you're trying to do. And right now Underhill is so difficult to deal with. And I ride a bike, I walk, and I also drive a car because I'm a New Yorker and some of us have cars. And I don't understand why making it one way is your priority. And I want you to explain how you're going to mitigate the huge traffic problem on Washington you've created. And also how people who might need cars for various reasons can't get them now on Underhill because some people can afford the luxury of having a more pleasant green block in something that some journalists call greenwashing to make it seem like upzoning the Northern part of Pacific Street and that area is okay. When we here on St. John's don't get the luxury of changing any of that because we are a fire lane for a fire truck, you know, we have a fire station on our block. So wait, 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 my question is, why is it that we should accept that it should be one way sometimes so that people who need rides to the doctor, who need to get to their job, who need to have an ambulance pick them up if they're hurt, and these people are riding around barriers all week from 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. all week. Why? Doing yoga on the street is really gross and not healthy. That street is full of things like PAHs, PACs, hydrocarbons, non-aqueous phase liquid, and that all goes downhill to the Guanas Canal, which I don't even want to talk about. Tell me how it is that you came to the conclusion that this is okay when most of my community wasn't invited to this meeting. And I don't just mean the Jewish people, I mean all the people of color on my block and all these other people that you always fail to get in touch with. So explain to me, I who actually do live on that corner should accept your plan because I'm so irritated right now that I have to be here. Do you hear my voice? I, I, as I, I do and I'm happy- I to was board president twice. So I am a business owner in this block as well. So I should have been asked to present earlier you told me that those were presenters. I'm a presenter and I'm presenting the real estate plan that you are trying to unfold here. And you're not including the whole community. You did it on, on do you know how to say Passover? Sir, sir I'm, or, I'm sorry, you, you, you have made some very strong points. Really appreciate your input. Pacque, pacque like in Italian is how you say Passover and Pesach because that's where it comes from. So you just screwed over. What if you had screwed over the Italian mothers in this neighborhood? What would they say? Now I'm going to lower my hand and shut the hell up. So we did say at the beginning of this presentation that we are very- You're not forgiven. 
Okay, that's fine. But I what what about the part where you were going to let let us answer your questions? Let let us just speak to some of what you raised. Okay, so uh, you had asked about how we inform people about this meeting. We drop direct mail to every address in Prospect Heights. The problem that we encountered was we 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 did not understand the mistake had, that had been made about scheduling this meeting till that piece was already at the printer. So there was no opportunity to not have this meeting tonight. Um, and um, that's why the meeting's going going forward. It's not something that we're, we're we're not happy with that result, and we put things in place to make sure this mistake doesn't happen again. Have you heard we're of the internet? Not, where the they internet don't doesn't, the, the internet I've doesn't reach the people in the neighborhood that you're concerned about. And we need to make sure we reach everybody, and that's why we do direct mail. We use the internet as well. I don't know what you mean by the, a real estate plan. We don't have a real estate plan. We do have a plan to help traffic calming on Underhill Avenue. And the reason that we have a traffic calming agenda here is because we have looked at Underhill Avenue for years as a source of accidents that endanger the children that use the street to get to and from school at PS9 and use the playground that is for small children on the block between Park Place and Prospect Place. There have been numerous vehicle accidents there over the years that have been a real concern. And until we came to open streets, and that became a pro program offering of the Department of Transportation, we did not have any success finding a solution to that, to some of that, to some of those traffic issues. But this is a street that's, that's used frequently by small children. And so it needs a solution that is, a, that that will deliver a quiet local street. We do not except having barriers on Underhill Avenue forever. It's not the solution we want either. The, the plan that um, Kyle spoke about earlier will involve removing those barriers and, and we won't be using them going forward. So we'll be able to deliver a quiet local street without the barriers that we know people are concerned about. So that that is part of the plan we believe that, that there's a lot of support for. Um, but Underhill Avenue is one of the few opportunities in Prospect Heights to take a street and prioritize it for local use, including use by uh, pedestrians, by cyclists, and, and by drivers as well. Um, so um, uh, this is why that well, this is why we're um, interested in making it a conversation. I'm local use. Do you hear me? I am local use. And I'm, I'm sorry, giving you... I'm gonna, I, you've had a lot of opportunity to state your views. I'm not trying to be rude to you, but I, I think you have had the opportunity to be heard. And if you have more to say, we'd be happy to meet with you offline as well. Um, Kyle, I just will we'll ask if you have anything you wanted to add to um, to the plan for Underhill Avenue. No, I would just add, oh, yes, I would just add that um, definitely, you know, I would say that the plan that we've developed in close coordination with the Prospect Heights community is really reflective of a pretty tremendous amount of outreach that we've been doing since 2021. Um, we've done events on Underhill Avenue, we've done them on Vanderbilt Avenue, we've done them virtually. Um, we've done all types of outreach, um, whether it be my banners, flyers, uh, social media. We, we also use the internet. Um, so I, I definitely hear you. And, and it, like Gib said, we'd be happy to meet with you at an offline and talk about your concerns. But um, we're not connected to real estate interests. I work for the city's Department of Transportation. Thank you. Uh, okay, I'll take the next question from Christy Spessard. What about over here? I'm just going in the order I have them on the screen. Don't worry, everybody will have a chance to uh, to speak. Oh, hi, yeah, this is, uh, uh, Christy's right here and I'm her husband, Ilya. Um, just had a question about the uh, traffic calming medians that you're planning, if those are actually planted in green or in rain capturing or those hardscape? Um, so it will be, uh, they'll have planters, they'll be movable planters um, in them. And then one thing I actually didn't mention in the presentation is that uh, both Vanderbilt and Underhill, as well as Grand Army Plaza is in what's called CPSC in city bureaucracy language. Um, so that means we're scoping out a capital project uh, for both, um, both corridors where we could formally integrate more uh, green infrastructure like permeable pavements, 
uh, rain gardens um, and, and other types of things that I think you're maybe interested in. Yeah, and, and just to follow up, who maintains those? Is that the neighborhood that maintains the plantings and chooses the plantings or is that the city's gonna plant them, but who maintains them as planters, the watering and care and tend, tending? That's always an issue. Yeah, so they'll be maintained uh, via a contract that the Department of Transportation has with the Horticultural Society of New York. Um, so they'll do the initial plantings and they continue maintenance and watering um, and do seasonal plantings um, for the next forever. Um, so uh, that will be who the maintenance partner is. And if anyone had any specific requests of types of horticultural elements they'd like to see uh, planted, we are happy to take those. Thank you. Okay, I'm um, gonna take the next question from Linda Dunn. Linda, can you hear us? You're welcome to unmute and so ask sorry. a question. I, I stepped away for a minute. Um, I have some questions for Kyle also. Um, so I know that you guys put some flyers up about this and we were also told that this was just going to be a meeting for the Vanderbilt. So I'm kind of surprised to hear and happy to hear you talking about Underhill. Um, I live on Underhill and um, I have to say, I also have worked in restaurants for 20 years. So I really appreciate the open streets helping the restaurants during the pandemic. However, by shutting off a main thoroughfare of Vanderbilt with lots and lots of parking. I think there's like 60 parking spots, 80. Now what's happening is traffic is just looping and looping and looping and looping through our residential streets. And that's causing a lot of noise, mm -hmm. exhaust. Um, I can't open my windows anymore in, on the weekends, which is awful. And it's just extremely stressful. And I'm wondering, I saw on your, um, your presentation and somebody sent me a link to these proposals that said your community feedback is about 1300 1400 people i mean this is a community of a lot more than 13 1400 people so i know that some of my neighbors went to the town hall some of my other neighbors were on the other phndc meeting um and i'm going to be really frank with you guys a lot of us feel like we've just been shut down and that we're not being heard and our concerns and our issues with these programs are just being dismissed and we're not really feeling like people are trying to work with us as a community. So there's been a lot of anger among my neighbors to be frank. Um, and so I've started walking around just asking people on the street that I know. I worked at a restaurant called Tavern on Dean for 10 years on Dean and Underhill. I know the street really well. I live on Underhill for 20 years. I know the street really well. I have no idea what you're talking about, that this is a super dangerous street. I'm wondering if it's possible that you've misappropriated some accident data from Atlantic and Underhill, because there were a lot of accidents there. Um, so I'd be curious to see the location of those accidents to see if it really is the entire street. Um, but more to my, my, my bigger concern is that as I'm walking around talking to my neighbors, a lot of them are upset that this is on Passover. A lot of them are upset that this is on the first night of um, spring break. So families with kids who are traveling can't join. And there is this sense that a lot of people in the community are being left out of the conversation. So I wanted to come tonight and sort of represent those people and say, hey, how can we be a little bit more inclusive because this program is like super fun for a small group of people, but it's also extremely painful. <laughs> it's not just a mere irksomeness, you know, like my friend is blind. He lost his eyesight last year. So he wasn't born blind. He's learning how to be blind and he can't get an Uber to pick him up at his door. And he has to make his way newly blind to the corner. My neighbor is 82 and has dementia. She has an aide who drives here and has to park to take her to doctor's appointments. Um, I myself was treated for cancer last year. I had to go to radiation every day and I also had broken my ankle and I couldn't get an Uber to pick me up. I had to hobble every day to the corner because the barricades. I know that the barricades are supposed to be, you can get locally picked up, but the drivers don't know that because it doesn't say that on the barricades. So a lot of them would say to me, well, you know, I'm not gonna get a ticket 
you know, so my, my other neighbor told me that her 71 year old mother was dropped by accessoride around the corner and had to make it halfway down the block with a walker. Um, my sorry, Linda, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt. I, I do want to answer some of your questions. And well, I, let me wrap it up for you then. Yeah, my concern you. is that if you are, I didn't get a mailer. Um, I don't know anybody else that knew about this meeting tonight because I talked to a bunch of people. Um, my concern is that if we're supposed to be this inclusive neighborhood and this is for the community and it's having a negative impact on the weakest members of our community, you know, the, the working class, the disabled, um, the elderly, is that really the community that we want to be? Is that really who we want to be designing for? Shouldn't we be designing our communities to be accessible to the most vulnerable, not people who can ride bikes? You know what I'm saying? So what do you say, oh, Kyle? Yeah. I also wanted to say, like, if you say there's no traffic on your corner, why are we doing traffic smoothing? Like that confused me when you said that too. So I didn't say that there wasn't any traffic. It said that there was. Well, no you didn't volume. say. It. You said there's <laughs> not a lot of traffic for this over-engineered. Ms. Dunn, could could maybe we you could let Kyle and uh, respond to some of your questions. I uh, go right ahead. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, so um, I guess where to start. So, um, like I mentioned, we've been doing a tremendous amount of community outreach for uh, these open streets on Underhill and Vanderbilt. Um, and one thing I will just let you know is that regardless of when open streets are in effect on Underhill or Vanderbilt, there is a tremendous amount of traffic across into this neighborhood. As a resident of this community myself, I get a first and and first-hand accounts of, of this traffic, and I know that this exists with or without open streets, and it's been here well before open streets ever came to be in this neighborhood. Um, that's why the city's Department of Transportation, you know, we really are working in a concerted way towards getting people out of their cars, prioritizing walking, biking, and transit, because there is virtually no more space in New York City to make uh, space for vehicles. Now, with that being said, we are totally cognizant of the fact that there are a tremendous amount of people and populations that greatly rely on vehicles, whether that be for their business, whether that be for accessoride, if they have a disability, pick up, drop up, whatever. There's a million reasons we need to get into it. And that's why we've designed Underhill really to better serve everyone. Um, it's an incredibly dangerous corridor. We did not misappropriate any data. Uh, crash data is publicly available online on the Crash Mapper website. Um, it has a history of being dangerous, um, resulting in people being injured, severely injured, and in some cases killed. Um, so there really is a tremendous need to make sure that our streets are safer for all. And I'll just add that um, you mentioned seniors, and seniors are actually some of the most vulnerable road users who are disproportionately um, victims of traffic violence. Uh, so we really are working towards making this street safe for all road users. Uh, I understand that there are certain traffic calming elements that um, result in one-way conversions and things like that, but 99% of the corridor, people can still drive on, they can still park on, and they can still get dropped off at. And one thing I want to also underscore, which maybe I didn't make clear when I presented, is that once you put this design in, the metal barriers go away. We move away from metal barriers, so there won't be any of those impediments that people need to get out of their car and move or, or sort of slalom around um, when uh, the street is redesigned. So um, by honestly the fall, you, we won't even have those barriers anymore. And we'll have a lot of great infrastructure with um, new curb extensions, bike lanes, greenery, granite blocks, um, and so on. Um, I'm not sure if I answered all your questions, but similar to the invitation that we extended to Joseph, happy to meet with you offline and talk uh, further. And I'll put my email in the chat afterwards. Okay, thank you, Kyle. Uh, we'll take the next question from Adam um, Onadi. Hey guys, thanks for taking the time to talk about this tonight. It's uh, it's super important. And I guess I'll start out by saying, you know, Vanderbilt Open Streets is amazing. I love it. Uh, I think the timing and how you guys conduct everything with that is is perfect. Um, however, I live on St. John's. I'm a renter. Uh, I don't own a property yet, um, but I do think that anecdotally and not looking at data or anything else, 
I think closing down Underhill for open streets is a huge, huge issue right now. Um, I think that it's it, it when we close down Vanderbilt and then we close down Underhill. When I have to drive up to the Bronx to go to work and then I'm on my way home, it can take me 45 minutes to go from Atlantic Avenue to St. John's going down Washington, which is a, a, a nightmare. It's 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 a pain in the ass. It's so frustrating. And it's super inconvenient. And then during the day, if I walk down Underhill and I, I take advantage of the, uh, the open streets, I find more often than not, uh, there's there's a car just driving down the street or whatever. And then it's it's getting underutilized by the community. I, I normally see maybe five people in the streets and we're closing down an artery that's shutting down. You know, it, it, it's a pathway for people when, when we're cut off on Vanderbilt. It, it, it's it, it. I don't know. I feel like I'm I'm breathing with one nozzle, uh, one nostril sometimes. So, with that being said, uh, I also think that it's 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 a little. It's interesting to me that a lot of houses on Underhill are single family homes rather than being rental units, which we see more on Washington, Franklin, Classen, and I. Th- I kind of feel, I kind of feel as though that closing down Underhill is carrying more to the homeowners rather than the renters uh, in this community, and that's that's probably my biggest gripe about the whole thing. Uh, with that being said, I'll continue to support Vanderbilt, but w- when the opportunity arises, you know, and this goes to vote or whatever it might be, I'm going to continue to object closing down Underhill, and that's it. Thank you. Okay. Thank. Thank you. Just would, would want to respond to just a couple of things, just to be just to be clear. Um, there is no time at which Underhill and Vanderbilt are both open streets, are both operating at open streets at the same time. Um, we specifically um, remove barriers on Underhill Avenue when Vanderbilt goes up on Friday afternoon, and the barriers on Underhill don't come back up until Monday morning. So there, there, there is no time when both of those streets have open streets in effect at the same time. Um, you're, you're correct. I'm, I, I might've gotten confused on that one. Or... Um, and, and, um, second, we want to point out that the barriers uh, that are as Kyle mentioned before, I just want to emphasize, um, we, we don't, we actually don't regard barriers as a permanent solution for either Underhill Avenue or Vanderbilt Avenue on Underhill Avenue. Um, we're able to implement some of the street improvements that Kyle mentioned earlier and actually, um, stop the use of barriers um, this year. Uh, and that will, um, I think, um, go a long way to overcome some of the concerns that people have raised about, about certain drivers not wanting to um, drive around the barriers. We actually have posted people on Underhill Avenue to watch the traffic patterns to make sure that services like deliveries like UPS and USPS uh, um, services like Accessoride can maneuver around the barriers, and we know they can. But we can't control the Uber driver who thinks that he's going to get ticketed for driving around the barrier. Now, again, our our intention is to try to get the barriers removed from Underhill as soon as possible. They're a temporary measure to help calm traffic, and even though they're a temporary measure, they're effective. Um, DOT had um, logged 136 incidents of traffic accidents on Underhill Avenue from 2016 to 2020. We're not aware of any that have happened while open streets have been in effect since 2020. So calming traffic on Underhill Avenue works. It helps reduce accidents. That's important, I think, to everyone. And we'll be able to do it pretty soon without having barriers deployed there. So I think that is really going to make that's that's really going to make a big difference. Um, Kyle, did you want to add anything? No. Okay. Um, so I, I just want to I just want to respond real quick. I understand that the barriers are supposed to be temporary, but it's it's an illusion, uh, you know. And yet again, anecdotally, with no with no data behind it, it's it's an illusion. You know, I, I could be walking down the street and there's a car behind me, and what am I supposed to do? You know, I can't, I can't be in control and there's nobody monitoring it. So it's, you know, I just kind of feel like it's completely unsafe. And, you know, if you guys do continue to go down this path, 
obviously if there's if there's medians or whatever uh built in i don't think that it's it's definitely going to th- slow things down but right now it's you know i feel uh, it, it's just not i just don't feel like it's safe and then you know going back to my my other question is like you know would this be effective if we put it on a class in avenue that's not as busy but uh you know it's it's a it's a rental it's a rental street like when i look at underhill and i look at like you know we're we're shutting this down we're shutting down underhill for open streets but there's one business or there's maybe like five businesses on the whole stretch it doesn't make any sense we should point out though that under the open street on underhill is in place for a different reason than vanderbilt avenue um, you had mentioned before that this program was a program that, that felt like a program that was prioritizing homeowners. Um, I think there are probably a lot of homeowners who might feel differently. And the reason I think that is because we know from surveying people who live in the neighborhood and who move to the neighborhood, that people moving to the neighborhood now who are more likely to be renters are also much less likely to own cars. So the 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 complaints that we get largely are actually uh, with respect to with respect to parking on under largely are from homeowners and and we know as the population of the neighborhood increases um, there will be as a proportion of everyone who lives in the neighborhood fewer people who own cars that's 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 the trend those people still are members of the public that have rights to public streets and so um by helping to make those streets safer for b- cyclists for pedestrians um w- we are extending that right to more members of the community here that, i think that that's a n- little misleading because you're saying that more people are moving in that are renters but you know if we walk down underhill it's primarily single family homes which i would assume a single family home where they own the whole brownstone they're probably going to own a car along with that they they may or they may not but the, yeah. the but i guess what i'm what i'm what i'm saying is they're not i i i'm sorry maybe i'm missing something i don't know i you're how does how does making underhill an open street benefit a car owner that because with that let me just say candidly we haven't heard that argument yet i i get no. a lot of complaints from people who say that car owners do not benefit from open streets i haven't heard anyone say that they do yet no, no, no. I'm not saying that open streets benefits car owners. It, it doesn't benefit car owners as somebody who owns a, a car. But I'm saying that the the people that live on Underhill, the I would say the majority of them own a home. And I feel like because they own a home and they're it's like we're gating off a community for all these homeowners and Sorry, then... I just want to interrupt you it's factually incorrect to say that the majority of people who live on Underhill Avenue are homeowners I mean there might be people who own their own homes or their apartments but I would say it's probably a pretty diverse mix of renters owners newcomers old timers um, it's it's just factually incorrect to say that uh, people who are homeowners um, I will just underscore that we've done a ton of outreach related to this project. The Open Streets program is permanent. We are legislated to make these upgrades. The city is working towards making our city more just accessible for people who are walking and biking. And Gib, I would prefer that we move on to the next question. Honestly, I'm going to interrupt you for a second. And I'm sorry, Joseph, please. The DOT uh, we will get, we will get back rat, to you at the end. We'll get back to you at the end. Problem. The rat problem, jo- 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 Joseph. I'm gonna. I'm sorry, but I'm gonna have to. I'm gonna have to have you leave the meeting. You, you, if you're gonna interrupt, you, you did have a chance to speak at length, and we need to take questions from other people who've been waiting now. Okay, so I'd like to move on and uh, and take a, a question from Mike Jones. Uh, you're welcome to unmute and ask your question. Yeah. Good evening. Um, I'm the president of the St. John Block Association between Washington and Underhill. I've um, been living in the community over 49 years, and I um, want to thank Joseph and probably one or two others. Unfortunately, we have a members of about 100 members of our block association, and we we're just getting a hold of this yesterday. So, Kyle, I know you keep saying there's a lot of outreach. Um, I'm 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 not making this like a, a negative Zoom, but it's a lot of untruths going on here. I have a thousand residents on my block. Nobody's hearing anything about this outreach. Now I talked to Gib. I think I believe the first meeting that I remember recall was 2001 on a Zoom. 
if we have this discussion, there's a plenty more people who are not aware, unfortunately, of what's going on, what PHNDC is doing all the time. And as you can see the numbers, if there's 50 to 60 individuals on this Zoom, and I think the young lady says she's about 13, 1400, and she knows there's more than that. If we was talking about from, we have to include also Eastern Parkway between Washington and Underhill from down to Pacific and Underhill to Vanderbilt. All of those residents down here and only having 50 people will show you. And there has never been a Zoom meeting on this situation, on this topic, with maybe more than 100, 125 people. So we know that the people that is really being affected are not able to have a voice. And that is the sad part. And that there's people who haven't even been in this neighborhood that long who are making decisions for people who, who don't even have access to the internet. Who those, those horrifying stories we heard about the 71 year old lady walking here. There's tons of those stories that everybody on this Zoom right now will not even hear about because they don't even have a chance to. The fact that Underhill, Vanderbilt, you put that into play, you know, it, it's, it's something, okay, that's cool. We all agree. It's not even that it wasn't agreeing, it wasn't a vote, but everybody, okay, fine, right? So the 69 bus, that goes, you know, that goes wherever it wants to go. People do use the 69 bus. So, okay, Vanderbilt is whatever, right? Now, poor Underhill. Underhill is only one of the shortest blocks in Brooklyn, at, as we all should know. It only goes from Eastern Parkway to Pacific. The daring and the, I mean, just the fact that they made a decision to close a land, um, on the hill off of Atlantic to put some big, ugly cement block so people can't even make the right. If I did live at the lower underhill, which I think the first building is 80 underhill or whatever, whatever building that is, I couldn't even get to my underhill by, instead I had to go around, especially on the weekends when Vanderbilt is closed. I mean, that inconvenience and you're using the 45 now, the 45 bus that people do use in Crown Heights, it's taking at least 30 minutes to get from Atlantic Avenue to St. John's Place. So now it's not, you're not just making it inconvenience for everybody in the 11238 area, everybody's being affected. And I'm so disappointed with New York City the Department of Transportation that this just keeps going over like it's like, okay, who, you know, whoever reaches to you guys first, and I hate to say it, it seems like whoever has the most money is, is what's making the decision. When I when I spoke on this Zoom a few times, the people said I was making good points, but it doesn't matter if I'm making good points because once again, we're back attack. It's like an attack on Underhill for people who don't have any voices. And I think that's what people are not understanding. It's not about complaining about somebody in the chat said, oh, don't complain about the, the street, the barriers are gonna be open. Yeah, but now it's past that now. Now you're making an Underhill, which been a two way. I mean, it's a small two way. If, you want to make it a little open, then I mean, I guess what you're going to do, remove, remove some of the parking because you're seeing a hundred accidents between uh, on the hill from a Eastern Parkway to Atlantic. I'm, I really doubt that. I'm not going to go on your stats, but come on, on the hill, I, I've been there for 50 years. It's no murders that's happening on a land on, on Underhill, and nobody is using Underhill that widely enough for you to change it to a one way this way and a one way that way. It's already inconvenient that you're closing, that Underhill is closed. So say you just opened it up tomorrow. Uh, Mike, Fine. Mike, do you have any specific questions that nah, you want to ask? It's not even because- the, Okay, we're, well we're, then we're I, I feel like about. we've definitely heard your feedback and I'm not yeah. going to be told that we've made up this information or yeah, haven't done due diligence. And that's the reason why um, people on this side is having a problem. You're saying what you're saying. You, you say you live in a neighborhood. It's not affecting you. It's not affecting the people in PHNDC. Y'all don't, don't care about the people that's in there and just say that. How many people on this at chat that even looks, that even have my skin color here? That's what, that's the my, problem. My, so my, go ahead. I, 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 yeah, you can put me on mute, but you know what's the problem. If I, if, I, if I may. Are you going to mute me too again? Are you going to kick yeah. me off? Mike, you did come to one of our other uh, Zooms and you and I have spoken. And I, at the time, um, worked on contacting you after that. I, we exchanged some email and I said, I'm very interested in organizing meetings and speaking with the folks in your on your block to understand what your concerns are. And but we never, you never that offer that offer is still good. But you know, yeah, the offer is good. But yeah, we, I don't know what more I can say. You, you, change, me and you have a conversation with my president block association. We need everybody from or whoever's making these decisions for all of these people who are not accounted for. It's just not about me and my block of saying. 
John, I, 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 unfortunately, I, I, I haven't speak. I, I've been there for the years, so I know everybody from St. Ethan Parkway to Pacific. I think it's just fair that I it's just not about certain I people. Think, That's all I'm saying. Okay, what I'm saying is this. It starts with being able to get the folks who live on your block in a dialogue. And we've made the offer, and the offer is still good. And I'd be happy to um, have us present at one of your block association meetings and answer questions from the folks on your block and, and get and get the dialogue going. I hope we had been able to start a couple of years ago. It was no, we tried to do that, and it wasn't even emails to emails to us of you know getting um, you know asking us for this and just telling Listen, us what if, if you if yeah, you have I'm, all I'm, of these I'm, members. I was quiet when you was talking. No, actually, you weren't quiet when I was talking. If you have, I'm sorry, this is completely disrespectful. You're going to. I'm sorry. What's disrespectful Are you kidding is, continue, is continuing to interrupt people when you've already had a lot of a, a significant amount of time to speak. We want to give everyone a chance to speak, and we're very interested in reaching everybody in the community. So, if you'd like us to meet with your block association, Mike, happy to do it. Happy to ha you 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 pick a date for us, and and we're happy to do it. All right, so thank you. Uh, thanks everybody. I don't see any other hands up right now for questions. Right here, um, right here. Oh. Uh, oh, Richard, you have a question? Okay, why don't you go ahead? I've been raising my hand all through time. You you never I, listen I understand, to but we're, we're, using, we're using the tools on Zoom, so I didn't see you. So we're happy to have you ask your question. Right. First of all, I'd like to see a copy of the permit that the DLT issues to PHNBC. <laughs> Can you email me a copy tomorrow? You'll need to submit a freedom of information request for that. Pardon? You have to submit a freedom of information request to get that information. When, when the, are you kidding me? We're, we're doing, doing this already. Job. Okay, I'm let, going let me, to respond you let to the question. Speak, please? If, You're interfering with my conversation now. When, when did the construction job, it has to be posted. A permit has to be posted. You people don't post it. We don't know what's going on. We don't know what the thing is. First of all, you send out, you send out this notice that says that April 21st. You don't have a permit yet. You don't have it. There's no, no permit was issued. Yes, How can you do, do that? They have it. They're approved to start on April 21st. No, it hasn't. I, yes, I, spoke, have. I spoke to Mr. Ingrid this morning. I don't know he who that is. No. He said there's no permit issued yet. This is a fact. You I, work for the DOT. Well, you should check it out. I don't know who Mr. No, Ingrid is, but no, I can you, assure you that they you are people do What you people do is lie about all your surveys, everything. What, what Joseph said about the rats, this is very true. Rats all over the place. Talk to the mayor. He, he's the rat specialist, right? This is a very you important allow, topic, allow, but Richard, we're not allow, here to talk about rats. Can you we, can, allow can, restaurants can, to put you allow restaurants to put tables on the street. It's rat ridden. And you think this is a great thing. You safety, safety. We have no safety here. No, we have no safety. Richard, I'm going to ask finish. you if you can, Let me if you finish. can stick to the Open Streets program. We are not involved. Here's the in Open Street right. program. No, on I'm Vanderbilt finished. Avenue, on Vanderbilt Avenue, there are streets that are not safe for, for emergency vehicles, especially fire. And the, the one that's in particular is between Prospect Place and St. Mark's. Right? That. We had, we had an incident where a bus came down and blocked the intersection of, of Park Place and Vanderbilt. He couldn't make the turn because of construction. That is up to you as the person who runs the, uh, the program to make sure that this should not happen. If that okay. happens, no, you should go to the people in charge and tell them, you can't do that. We're closing the street. You can't do that. Vehicles okay. can't turn. So Richard, let me answer that question. And then I think we, we do have now several other folks who are raising their hands. So we'll, we'll have to move on to some well, other- But you always move on when I'm talking. No, I, no, no, every, I'm, I'm, no I'm every, time, you, every time I speak, you move on. Or there's no, not I'm afraid time. that we have other people who are asking questions. And you had someone that was up there three times as long as I have. Okay. Yeah, well, that's something that also we didn't at the time they were talking, we didn't have a queue of folks who, wanted, who had their hands up. Let me let me just answer your question about the buses that are blocked at, Van, at Vanderbilt and Park Place. The MTA reroutes the B69 bus. 
they post this route to their drivers, but sometimes the drivers have not read it and they have people who are substituting and don't understand that they're not supposed to take that route. We have a protocol worked out with the MTA. When, when that happens, we advise their drivers to call supervision. Our instructions from the MTA are we must wait for supervision to arrive to move the bus. The bus, we, we cannot assist the driver in moving his bus. That is, not, that is not the MTA's instruction and we are obligated to follow their protocol. So that's what happens in the, cases of, in the case of buses and everyone who works for us understands that protocol. Um, I'm gonna take the next question from Megan Evans. Just a minute, I haven't finished. I'm I haven't sorry, finished. I want to answer your question. We have, we have a queue of people. I wanna answer your question. Them. We need to make room for the other folks. Um, Ms. Evans, would you like to ask Thanks, a question? You know, you're rude. You are rude. It's true. You're not doing a great job tonight. Just you. Just so you know. Thanks. Appreciate it. Um, Ms. Evans, do you have a question you'd like to ask? Hi, I just have a question about the new Underhill Plaza and the decision making process between shutting down that street and making it a seating area uh, when there's right next door an already underutilized park being Lowry Triangle. And would the money spent on shutting that street down have not been better used to improve Lowry Triangle and make it more inviting for people? It's already hardly used. And I live right next to the Underhill Plaza and there's almost never anyone sitting there. And then on top of that, it's creating traffic issues because now people can't turn onto Underhill from Atlantic. So on my block of Washington, it's backing up traffic. There's a huge amount of noise pollution, which has already been a problem from the open streets. So I'll just mention so I can, um, that, go ahead. Yeah, so I'll just mention that the plaza. Um, so we did a lot of great community outreach over the last few years, and people really identified that as an opportunity for a permanent pedestrian plaza. We definitely agree with you that there's also some improvements that could be made um, with the Lowry Triangle. So we're working with the Parks Department to uh, enhance both the Triangle and the Plaza in the long term. So we'll have more to share about that um, in the coming years. Um, we continue to monitor uh, traffic uh, in and around the Plaza, um, as well as in and around just open streets generally. Um, and we'll make any sort of tweaks as needed, but generally speaking, um, the same type of traffic that was there before is kind of still there before. And um, in the long term, we find that, you know, the, the wider traffic network can absorb uh, that uh, sort of new traffic pattern. And, and I'll just mention it again, you know, the city, we're moving towards uh, prioritizing walking, biking, and public transit uh, in the future. As a resident, I can definitely say that's not true. The traffic is hugely increased and the noise pollution is crazy. And no one's using that pedestrian plaza. I mean, it's a nice idea, but no one's using it and no one uses Lowry Triangle to begin with, which is already kind of an empty park. So it just didn't make sense. Um, is there been an impact study done that's widely published? Uh, we're not traffic? required to do impact studies. Okay, it seems like that would be a wise thing to do um, when you're considering shutting streets down. Let me say that, that that plaza is used. It's used every day the furniture is put out. I was there yesterday and practically- Dude, a, come on. Folks That's not there. true. I live right next to that plaza. I, I'm, never not, there. I'm, I'm sorry, but I'm telling you what I saw with I'm others here who are in this meeting. Qualitative data. Joseph, I'm going to have to remove you now from the meeting. I'm sorry. If you do that, you kick a Jewish guy out of the meeting, just so you know. Park, but I just, it just doesn't, like, it's already such an issue with the traffic from the open streets. I think the open streets is really nice. It benefits a lot of people. But I feel like the way you guys are framing all this traffic stuff and the car issues you frame it as if nobody in the city needs to use cars. And that's simply not true. Cars are not just for the privileged. There's people who work in, in areas that aren't served by public transit who need to use cars. There's elderly, there's people with children, there's sick people. People need to use cars to get around the city. There's just no way around that. So sure, people can keep walking, biking. I also walk and bike, but I have to have a car for my job, as do many people I know. It's just part of life. 
So I'll just say that there are 6,000 miles of streets in New York City, and there are only 28 miles of open streets. So there are thousands of miles for people to still drive and park all across New York City. It's less about the open streets. It's more about the impact of the open streets. Right, on that the also mentioned something that I mentioned earlier is that, you know, with or without open streets, there's still a tremendous amount of traffic. You can be on Washington or Vanderbilt Avenue on a Thursday evening, a Friday evening when open streets is in effect, and it is bumper to bumper traffic. Uh, so that's why the city really is progressively working towards getting people out of their cars and prioritizing people walking, biking, taking the bus, taking the train, and so on. That's fine, but not everybody has that luxury. Some people have to actually use cars to get them. Well, I totally hear you on that front. I would just say that there are some people who maybe don't necessarily need to drive and are just doing so as a luxury and maybe we'll get them out of their cars. Yeah, I, I don't think anybody's driving for fun. I yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so I would mention to... that there are a lot of people who do just to make a personal choice to do that and maybe don't necessarily to do so. Obviously, people make choices for a million reasons, and we could go back and forth on that all night. Um, Megan, but Ms. 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 Evans, I'm going to I'm going to move on to another question okay, now. But I... Can you just explain why you don't do impact studies beyond the fact that you're not required to do them? So this We're is gonna... an in-house operational project that doesn't require an environmental impact study as, as you're sort of suggesting. Uh, we did do traffic counts and traffic studies ahead of implementing the plaza, but it was not a formal environmental impact study. Okay, well that plaza is an underused eyesore. You should really okay. focus on the triangle instead. Noted. Thank you. Um, I'm going to go on to take a question from Michaela Daniel. Sorry, sorry, that was not unmuting. Um, so I just want to say thanks. First of all, we live on we live on Vanderbilt. Sorry for the crying baby in the background. Um, and love, 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 love the open streets, and it's great. Um, I just, Kyle, as somebody who's worked with DOT for a long time, I know that you're not making up numbers, but please don't say again that you've done extensive outreach. Just don't say it again tonight, because obviously folks on this call don't feel like there's been extensive community outreach. And like, so let's just, let's just say, great, next time we need to do more different, better somehow on top of what you've already done. Um, I have two questions uh, regarding Vanderbilt Open Streets. One is, and I've seen it in the comments, the speed, you know, I get little kids that play on the open streets and like people fly on e-bikes and all the rest of it. And there are like three cones at the beginning that demark the uh, bike lanes from the other side. The question is, can we add like 10 cones, especially between Park and Prospect, just to make it clearer what is the bike lane and which is not? Um, that's one, uh, I guess a request. Um, I said two, but I have three. Uh, second is last year, there were a ton of people that just stayed parked on Vanderbilt during the open streets. So another request is, can we do something to encourage people to move their cars uh, off the block during open streets? Um, and three is, you know, I'm really concerned about the comment I saw about what are we doing about the barbecues in the street? I, you know, I'm sure there are no open barbecue laws. I'm sorry if it's causing respiratory issues for people, but I am concerned, you know, the, the, what was the, the vegan restaurant that had like a fun dance party on Saturday nights between Prospect and St. Mark's that was a predominantly black crowd. And the open streets are not predominantly black these days. And that got shut down. And I'm concerned that people are gonna try and shut down our black long-term neighbors from barbecuing on the streets and enjoying it. So what is the process? My question is, what is the process if somebody complains and tries to shut some kind of activity down? Is there any sort of way that folks can weigh in to keep it from being shut down or does it just get shut down? Okay, so let me take a crack at all three questions. First question about the bike lane. Um, Monday was our equipment drop day on Vanderbilt Avenue. We put out an incredible amount of equipment on Vanderbilt Avenue. And um, the configuration we're starting with is um, 16 cones on each block of the open street right now. Um, we also use cone top signs that show which side is the bike lane and which side is the pedestrian lane. We don't put them on every single cone, but we put four of, we're, we're going to start with four of those on each block. 
Um, I, I haven't visited every open street in New York City, but we put out more equipment to try to delineate those lanes and seg. I know, separate. I'm sure. It no, just no, 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 I'm not. I'm please, I'm not trying to argue with you. I just want to let you know that it's a major focus. We very much care about trying to keep the streets safe, and we okay. also we also care about being able to keep bicycles moving. We we need to do both of those things because as Saskia mentioned earlier, we get an upwards of 500 bicycles an hour on Vanderbilt Avenue and it's too many to slow down. I mean, we have we have to let them move through the street otherwise we'll we'll have a different kind of a chaos. So we we are constantly looking at ways we can try to in, improve the safety of that setup and um we're happy to listen to all suggestions. It's it's a major focus for us. We feel like We've made a lot of improvements, but there's obviously there's obviously more to go. You know, it's a it's a balancing act between um, what we can physically put out and pull back from the street every day. We're going to do this 85 days this year, and it that makes know, sense. We, that makes a lot of sense. Yeah, so it it is a balancing act, but we it doesn't mean we don't want to hear. Is what, 16 tons a block more than you did last year? Well, it depends. If it, if it was at the beginning of the year, maybe not, but at the end of the year, it might have been. The, the, the problem is that the that, that cones, you know, are something that, that starts to whittle down by the end of the year. Um, so we're going to, you know, we, we try to, uh, what's the best way to put this? We try to do the best we can creating six acres of open space on a temporary basis every weekend with a bunch of temporary equipment. No, totally. Um, and you do a great job. Keep going. It, it's, it is it, it it is a challenge, but doesn't doesn't again doesn't mean we don't want to hear about hear hear feedback. We do. Um, your second question was about cars, cars that don't move. Yes, got a great answer for that one. Um, the Department of Transportation is doing a um, parking sign no standing pilot for Vanderbilt mm -hmm. Avenue. We're going to have no standing signs, permanent, no real, honest to peanut butter. No standing signs on Vanderbilt Avenue go in before our season starts this year, and drivers will be ticketed. Wow! If they, great. If, they, if, if they if they're staying on the avenue during open streets, um, so we recognize that's a problem too. And uh, candidly, prior to having those signs in place, um, D, uh, NYPD traffic was not interest was was not willing to enforce on the basis of the laminated signs that were zip tied to the. To the Kendor out there. So the permanent signs are different ball okay. games. Um, lastly, with respect to barbecues um, and, and, and other kinds of things, we don't function in an enforcement capacity. Um, we have no ability to enforce the laws of the city of New York. Um, and um, so we are limited to uh, and required under agreements with DOT to report activity on the street that is you know that potentially represents a problem but we do not act in any way to enforce those laws um some people might feel we should but we can't other people have the concern you have that you know we don't want to create a situation where there's some kind of you know some kind of targeted enforcement we're sensitive to that too um at the end of the day that is the responsibility of the nypd and um Candidly, we don't see that they're interested right now in enforcing. We we, we don't see that that they are taking action against folks with barbecues. Um, we have concerns about it from a safety point of view, but that's kind of beside the point. Their their policy right now is um, if it doesn't look like a threat, it's not going to be the subject of enforcement. Um, the last thing I wanted to address, even though I think the person who asked the question is off the phone, she mentioned um, the dance party that took place um, in 2020 and part of 2021 in front of American Vegan. That was not shut down. Um, that ceased because of my understanding was there's a dispute between the proprietor and the DJ and um, the dispute put an end to the DJ. So it had nothing to do with it being shut down. I'm um, going to move on to another question from Patrick. Uh, go ahead. Howdy. Uh, I echoing a little bit of, I believe her name was Linda um, with the bike lane as a restaurant that has to cross the bike lane um, also and seeing kids and caring about the kids. And I have like a whole tour guiding thing where I'm like, hey, kids, 
I know you don't always listen to your parents, but maybe you'll listen to the random stranger that's in front of you. Please do not go toward that bike lane. I have seen countless uh, very near misses. And I have also seen not directly on Vanderbilt Avenue, but on Bergen um, during the open street program, somebody getting hit by an electric scooter. Um, is there anything in the DOT toolkit a la like suburban neighborhood, like you're going too fast, like sad face, you're going too slow. Like, is there any way to actually set some sort of radar function on a block? I mean, the only other idea we had was to get like a lifeguard in a lifeguard stand at branded saloon and have a whistle and just slow down. This is a neighborhood. I don't, I don't know what to do, but I feel like there should be some sort of something in a toolkit to ensure that the bike lane, they're not going 35 miles an hour or 20 miles an hour. They're definitely not going five. So we, um, like I mentioned earlier, are in the CPSB phases for capital build out of both Vanderbilt and Underhill, which is a ways off. So I think in the long term, we definitely want to permanently design uh, this street with that exact thing that you just mentioned in mind to reflect open streets operations and sort of just the day to day normal operations of that street overall. So I think that's a, a definitely big wish list item as, as we do go towards the capital project. We can definitely talk to, to THNDC a little bit more about added signage and, and cones. Um, it is, you know, there are certain things within our toolkit that we can more robustly deploy, but um, short of more permanent changes to uh, the uh, to the street, um, we're we're still going to have a little bit of an, an issue. Um, but um, like I said, in the long term, it is something that's high on our list to incorporate formally. Um, but in the short term, we'll, we'll think about maybe adding up a little bit more signage, cones, um, and maybe even just trying to do some informational outreach, um, especially to delivery cyclists, which you know we all rely on delivery cyclists, whether you're a business owner or someone who gets deliveries um, on a daily basis. Um, so maybe we can work with some of our like delivery organizations and, and just also general bike education um, organizations to just uh, talk to folks about the rules of the road, going slow, being mindful of that they're in a shared space. Um, Is the there way. any talk? I mean, I'm not a fan of having the NYPD on the block ever at all times, but is there any uh, collaboration with them where they would actually ticket people, like do one day or like, scare the I delivery think, drivers like once or twice during the year. I mean, if I they're doing anything else, I think that yeah. it would be great that there was actually a, some sort of incentive, like, hey, these people got fined or, or the restaurant that was encouraging them to drive that quickly for like delivery turnovers to get fined, maybe not the actual drivers. I don't know. It just, it seems to be a prevalent issue and safety is our top concern. We should think a little bit outside the box. And I know that we are willing to like help, you know, contribute to like a radar smiley face, if that is a possibility. So I think um, let's take the carrot approach first and trying to do some education, being proactive. Maybe we could be out there and giving folks some free bike bells and bike lights just to incentivize them to listen to us about uh, hearing uh, the rules of the road. Um, maybe we will need to do that maybe over a couple weekends um, in, in the spring. Um, we, we could go down the enforcement route. Um, I think that that's helpful, but um, I would prefer to start with education. And then um, if we need to go to enforcement, we can definitely talk to our uh, PD counterparts. Yeah, I, I would say on the enforcement side, that was attempted on Fifth Avenue on their open streets with with somewhat disastrous results. Um, that where the NYPD began ticketing uh, deliveristas on on Fifth Avenue. Um, that that they got a real reverse halo for that. Uh, so I, I agree with Kyle. I think we should start with I think we should start with education. Um, let me take a question from Carrie uh, Drapcho. Go ahead and unmute. And ask your question. Hi, thank you. Um, so I live on St. John's and Underhill, a member of the Block Association with Mike Jones. Um, I have a few questions. First, 
related to what Megan brought up earlier, I understand that you mentioned you don't do an impact report, but we've talked a lot about traffic data. Um, I'm curious about walking data of like pedestrians on Underhill. What I think it would be a shame that while I love a lot of these updates in terms of making it safer to bike down Underhill, because it's very dangerous at the moment, I'll say for that. Um, I hear so many of the concerns with the cars and something I foresee potentially happening, which would be a huge shame is that this street gets shut down. Well, not getting shut down, but we're changing the traffic patterns and then it's not having that much walking traffic. I work from home in the neighborhood or on work heights on Underhill. So I am on it when it's shut during the day, during the week and there. It's just hard to see that the benefits of shutting it down to traffic because I don't, I don't see like the tons of pedestrian overflow that would be necessary to shut down the street all the time. Um, secondly, wanted to ask, I did not think that I got a mailer and I found it and it is a postcard that says open streets town hall. And I just wanted to add that, that I think that was a bit misleading open street, good vibes town hall. I would have no idea that that had anything to do with the construction on Underhill. Um, so it seems like someone from our block found out about it this morning and I was able to join. So I'm thankful that she found out somehow, but it seems like between Linda talking about many people on her blog on Underhill and I know many of us on St. John's have not heard about any of this and we've gotten people in the chat saying that they'd be happy to reach out. And Gib, you've been saying we can talk to all of us one-on-one, -on -one, but I am happy to help Mike get like, reach out to the, everyone on the block and make that happen. But tactilely, I really wonder what, what can we do about that? Like what will happen? Is this plan going to just be put into place anyway? Is there anything our voices can do to change any of it? Well, so what, first of all, let's start with trying to put together a meeting where we can talk to you. Uh, I mean, that is an offer I made to Mike a couple of years ago and I'm, I, I'm sorry that it wasn't pursued, but it's not too late, and and we can have that discussion with you. Um, the you know the the plan that Kyle went through this evening involves taking barriers off of Underhill Avenue. That that does seem to be something that most folks would like to see happen, mm -hmm. and we're glad that that's something we're going to be able to accomplish this year. So. So you will see that happen. Um, but again, I'm going to repeat something I mentioned earlier. Underhill Avenue is not the same type of open street as Vanderbilt Avenue. To call them all open streets in a way creates an impression that maybe they're all they're all the same thing, but they're not. We we never have expected pedestrian traffic on Underhill at the volumes we get on Vanderbilt on weekends. The opportunity on Underhill is really to to create a quiet local street that can be used by families with children without ex exposure to the type of accidents we've seen over the last few years. And it is performing on that basis. Um, we'd like to have it, it would be even better in our view if we didn't have barriers there to accomplish that. And we think we can do that. And quite frankly, the street's gonna look a lot nicer and we think that people are gonna enjoy not having the barriers in place anymore. But let's if you have if you're involved with your block association and can work to help us organize a meeting we'd love to be able to do that um can i move on let me let me move on to the last question uh, from rick roth rick go ahead uh rick are you there no hi it's mary i'm rick oh, hi mary hi um, so uh, my concern, what I wanted to talk about was the traffic. So there's a streets that have open streets that have no traffic, but we live on the streets that have to that pick up the slack that, you know, are impacted by traffic. Um, and one of the things is that when Vanderbilt flows, it, it flows to traffic. Um, it goes, you know, so it goes onto park or other streets, but Vanderbilt, I'm sorry, but Underhill basically is kind of like the escape valve because that's a route that people can take. So the traffic, instead of going on Vanderbilt, they go on Underhill. And that works, you know, when when the when um, the barricade, you know, when Vanderbilt is having open streets. If you are going to, it sounds like, try to slow the traffic down on Underhill, 
and I guess as a natural extension, you're reducing the capacity of through, of through traffic. Where is the traffic going to go on um, particularly like it ebbs and flows over the weekends, but particularly Friday night, you cl close it right at rush hour. And so everybody's driving, you know, through the neighborhood to get to wherever the bridges are wherever. And Underhill is going to be closed. I mean, uh, Vanderhill is going to be closed. And if Underhill can't take that capacity, it seems to me we're just going to be totally gridlocked. And I just want to know what you've thought about that, if you have thought about it, and how is it going to be ameliorated? Ameliorated? Ameliorated. <laughs> So, like I mentioned earlier, um, as a part of all of these changes, including the plaza block that we implemented, as well as the one-way conversion blocks that will be implemented later this year, uh, we did do uh, traffic counts, which I think Carrie asked earlier about if we did pedestrian counts, that also uh, included pedestrian counts. Um, and we have run the sort of models that we need to do in order to make these changes. and. Um, we felt that uh, the traffic network will be able to absorb any sort of traffic impacts that might happen as a result of these um, uh, new one-way conversions. But I think someone earlier mentioned that, you know, generally speaking, Underhill isn't really a through corridor already because it only uh, goes from Atlantic to Eastern Parkway, and now yeah, realistically, it only goes from Pacific to Eastern Parkway. Um, but is closed from Atlantic. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. What, what when, when Vanderbilt is closed, you know, when Vanderbilt is closed, Underhill takes the overflow. And that's why you don't close them together. Otherwise, you could leave them both, you know, you could leave Underhill, uh, uh, when I say closed, I mean with the barricades up, you could have Vanderbilt closed all the time, but you don't. You have Underhill open, a Vanderbilt closed. Vanderbilt open, Underhill closed, because they're, you know, offsetting the traffic. And as I said, for instance, on um, Friday night at rush hour, when Vanderbilt closes for open streets, all the traffic comes down park. You know, it's very narrow streets. Um, you're honking within a few minutes. Um, it, it's, it's really a problem. And I can't, it seems as you're removing the capacity on Underhill, I, I don't know what it's gonna be like when this happens. I guess it's really a problem. And it's like, it's really wonderful for people on Underhill Avenue, let's say, to have their peaceful closed streets, but the traffic has to go somewhere. And it goes onto our blocks. Well, Mary, you and I live on the same block. I mean, our, our block is, a, our, our block is, a, has been a through street for all of the 32 years I've lived here. I mean, well, we, we get a tremendous amount of, we've always received a yeah. tremendous amount of tr through traffic. And, and I don't know that, I, I wish it was otherwise. I mean, we're not proposing to change anything with respect to Park Place. Yeah. But the truth of the matter is Prospect Heights is kind of in the crook of Eastern Parkway, Atlantic Avenue, Flatbush Avenue. Yeah. Those are all major arterial roads. They're arterial highways, yeah. And, and, and we get a tremendous amount of through traffic, more yeah. than other our, our other neighboring um, communities like Clinton Hill and Fort Greene yeah. and, and yeah. Park Slope. So this this is, you know, the people who live in, in, in this neighborhood also have a right to have some, to, to have a quiet street, not, we're, it's not gonna be every street in the neighborhood, but one of yeah. them that services a, a public lower school and a playground for young children isn't a bad choice. But not on Friday night. I mean, and that's when, particularly during rush hour, when people are coming down Vanderbilt and all of a sudden they can't go any further. And they, you know, so they have to make a right, they go down park, and then they can go down Underhill, it gets them down in the general direction they're going south. But um, I'm just saying without that, with that ex extremely reduced capacity, how are you gonna prevent it from just being total gridlock, honking, you know? I, I, it's just a major, and, and the fact that you don't apparently do many studies, you say you don't do impact studies, you don't look, you know, I, I don't. It's so just, I wanna be clear, we do not do impact studies, but everything that we're doing is a traffic study. There's a incredibly different uh, set of things that have to happen as a part of an impact study versus what happens in just a traffic study. But I mean, do you know how much carbon monoxide there is, let's say on this street, which is, it's a very narrow street. And when, you know, it's like a canyon. And so cars are backed up, you know, 
All right. Like, so like time. I mentioned earlier, we, we collected all the traffic data and have uh, run our traffic models and we'll continue to observe um, post-project implementation well, what, and, and what make would any you tweaks do? if needed. Now, what would you do? What's your plan B? It's a catastrophe. You know, it's all, you know, whatever. People Mary, are honking. <laughs> Mary, there's no reason at this point to project a catastrophe. Okay. I, I mean, I, I mean, it's it's obviously something that we're all here watching, and you know, if there's adjustments, there will be, there will there will be adjustments. But but we're not, we're really not in a position of, you know, leaning over the edge of Carmageddon here. We've 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 this is we're going into year four. You can you can go down like if you drive down around um, Dean and um, the streets down there going towards Flatbush, there's horrendous gridlock down there, like on Saturdays during certain, you know, when people are out in the middle of the day, it, I, it gets pretty bad sometimes. And I just wondering if we're going to have to have that too. That's all. Let, let me say something that, that, you know, I, I often ask folks who raise concerns about, about traffic as a result of some of these things. Do you, do you imagine there's a point in the future that you can see where driving and parking in Brooklyn will be easier. I, I don't know, but I'm somebody, I, I worked, you know, I worked literally 40 years. I always took public transportation. I never drove. I'm at a point in my life where I can't do the subway stairs very well. And I do have need of a car. And I, you know, I, I think that there are some people who have said there are times that people really need cars. I, I've I, owned a I, bike for years. I rode a bike until the point where I don't really feel so good riding a bike anymore. I, I don't feel it's safe. And I, you know. I, I understand. I, I, I think <laughs> I own a car as well. But as a car owner, I have to say that it's not going to become easier to own a car in New York City. We are, we're going to have more people move into this neighborhood. Um, they're, going yeah. to, they're going to move into larger buildings at the north end of the neighborhood. And, and we may get more we may get more folks moving into the existing housing in the neighborhood. When that happens, we're not going to be able to provide curb space for more cars. Well, I'm not, that's not really what I'm talking about. I'm well, not, no, let's no, but, when no, I drive my car. No, no, but there's, like, there, but, but. I just this, said there was a lot of gridlock. Um, I, I, I understand that, but the, the way to, it, there, there is at the end of the day, no solution to gridlock by creating more capacity. But by done. removing street, but to arbitrarily take a street and shut it down and say, okay, all that traffic is going to go somewhere else. I think you have to assume some responsibility, and you know, not you, but DOT perhaps, for figuring out where that traffic is going to go. And as you said, we're arterial. We're not people driving around you down, to the, down to CBS or, you know, Dwayne Reed. These are people going through this neighborhood or going into Manhattan or going further into Brooklyn. You know, they're going down to the highway to go to Staten Island. You know, this, this traffic we have here is is spur traffic. So I, I mean, I, I think we, what we've heard is that there are analyses done before these plans are put in place. And obviously, you know, we're not we're at a stage where we're implementing things with paint and gravel and we have opportunities to adjust. But I, I having had now, you know, more than three years experience with this, I, I, I don't think we're projecting a major catastrophe but, but what you're doing to underhill is going to seriously impact okay. the ability um, to i'm sorry to I, we need to uh wrap i think up. I, yeah i think yeah, we're it, gonna, better be some, it better be some mutant going we'll on because we'll see up. what happens <laughs> yeah you, you guys did hear everybody just say that underhill is a Okay, listen, I, I, we've heard a lot of feedback. We really appreciate it. And we're absolutely willing to go further and take this offline. There'll be more outreach as well on street on Underhill, as Kyle mentioned. But we've also been on the Zoom for two hours now. So with mm -hmm. respect to everybody who's here presenting and everybody who's attending, um, I think it's time that we draw the meeting to a close as far as I can see everybody who's wanted to be able to ask questions and be heard has mm -hmm. had that opportunity. So we appreciate your participation and uh, look forward to working with you as we go forward. Um, I'd like to thank Kyle Gorman of DOT for joining us this evening and um, our, uh, our chair and co-chair Saskia Hoggins and Catherine Pangaro for presenting um, this evening and um, uh, thank all of you for joining us and uh, have a pleasant evening. Thank you, Gib. Thank you, DOT.
Thank you, everyone.